Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. Over the last few weeks, I have posted several videos covering family games that I think are good games to play with children whilst you are on lockdown. And one of the prerequisites for selecting those games was I wanted to pick games that had a certain educational value to them. Now, obviously, word games have an educational value to them and as I'm a writer a lot of people assume that I like word games but to be honest I'm not a massive fan but undeniably they are good games to play with children to help them improve their vocabulary and their literacy. Unfortunately I have found that many word games are somewhat difficult to play with people of all different ages because your actual current vocabulary, your uh, internal dictionary will play a strong part in winning the game. So if you're playing against children, there's a very good chance that unless you purposefully throw the game, as if you don't try to win, there's a good chance that you're going to win. I mean, Scrabble is obviously the game that most people think of when they think of a word game. And that can be a very difficult game, uh, particularly for younger children who haven't expanded their vocabulary because you are given a set of tiles and you have to create words from those tiles, from a limited tile set. Um, and if you don't have a lot of words to draw on, that can be very difficult. Um, there was another game called Upwards, which is very similar to Scrabble, except you can actually stack tiles on top of each other. Uh, for example, if somebody had played the word lick, you could put a P on top of the L to make it pick and score that as a word as well. Then there was Boggle. Boggle makes it a little bit easier to play with younger children because short words are just as important as longer words. Everybody's playing at the same time. And then at the end of the timer, you compare your list of words. And if somebody else has got the same word as you, you can't score points for that word. You have to cross it out. But if you come up with words that nobody else has got, then you will score a point for that word. For example, if um, I had put leg in my list, but somebody else had put leg in their list, I wouldn't be able to score that word. But if nobody else had put leg in their list, I would score points for the word leg. So it's not necessarily about the length of the word, it's about how many words you can identify and hopefully words that other people are not able to identify. Again, though, the problem there is that it tends to be the case that older players with a larger vocabulary will be able to pick and identify more words. Which brings us to the game that I want to talk about very briefly today, That Flipping Word Game by Paul Lamond Games. Here's the game setup. As you can see, it comprises 64 discs in a frame, and each of these discs has a single letter on the reverse, except for the disc that has the classic QU combo. And this is a very simple word game, but I quite like it because it does three things that sort of alleviate some of the problems that you get with other word games. First of all, it introduces a certain amount of randomness. Second, it introduces a memory element. Some people that might not have such a strong vocabulary but have a better memory have opportunities to gain an advantage over other people who might not have such a good short-term memory. And third, it sticks to using small words. The maximum word size is five letters. The only problem really is there is a small disadvantage to the first player who is working on a completely unknown grid. Because what happens is on your turn, you have this special custom dice, which has numbers from three to five. You roll the dice and then you get to flip that many tokens. So in this case, I would get to flip three tokens. Let's flip this one, this one, and this one. I've got T, O, and A. What I now have to do is I have to make a word that uses at least two of those letters. So I don't have to use all of the letters, but I do have to make a word that is at least two letters long. In this case, I can make the word oat, O-A-T. And that means I will get to remove all three of these counters from the board and I will keep them for scoring at the end of the game. Each token I have in my stash is worth one point. 
if, for whatever reason, I cannot use all of the letters that I have revealed. Say, for example, I had rolled a 5 and I'd also flipped over this I and this E. Once I have removed any counters that I have used to make a word, any remaining counters get flipped face down again. And now, everybody at the table knows that there's an I here and an E here. So on their turn, when they roll the dice, if they flip over, say, a P, they know they have an I and an E here, so they can make the word pi. So remembering where those other counters are gives them a distinct advantage that I didn't have when I flipped over those tiles. And that's quite an interesting mechanism because not only uh, does that memory element help to level the playing field somewhat, so it becomes slightly less important to have a vast vocabulary, it also plays into the randomness of the dice roll. On my turn, when I roll the dice, if I roll a three, I'm only flipping three counters. That means I'm going to have less options for words to make. However, if I can make a word, there's a very good chance that I'm going to be using all of the letters. Even if I can only make a two letter word, I'm only leaving one counter on the board that someone else will then be able to use on their turn. However, if I roll a five, I'm going to have a lot more options for words to make. But if for whatever reason, I can only make a two letter word, for example, I'm leaving three counters on the board, which now everybody else knows, and they can all take advantage of that open knowledge on subsequent turns. You don't really get those scrabble type moments where you're stuck with a load of tiles that you can't do anything with, and the game moves quickly. Um, as long as people can remember where a few letters are, they can usually make something. And because you're only working with three to five letters at a time, and you can actually make words that are only two letters long, it doesn't matter if you know lots of huge words. That's not relevant to this particular game. It's going to come down to those smaller words. Three and four letter words are the big ones. And if you can ever pull off a five letter word, um, that's a rare occasion, really. Overall, this rule set makes this, for me, one of the better games that are word related to play with younger children because you don't really need to uh, handicap yourself in any way. The randomness, the memory element, the fact we're only using small words means that everybody can get involved and everybody can have a good chance of winning. And in fact, my daughter tends to beat me quite a bit. The only other downside really is setting up the game is a bit of a pain because you've got to put 64 counters into this plastic frame which takes a little bit of time. Other than that, I think this is a good one. If you're looking for a word game, this is one worth checking out. But that's it from me for now. Thank you so much for listening. If you have enjoyed the video, please consider pressing the like button. If you have really enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.